Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Sunday service. Today is June the 13th, 2020. I believe it's June the 13th. Is that right? I think it might be the 14th. It's the 14th. <laughs> anyway, here we are on a Sunday morning, on a fine Sunday morning. So today I have all of my priest vestments on because I'm going to continue talking about the sacraments and um, and also about, about uh, clerical vestments, which I think is uh, something that people, you know, like to understand, you know, what's up with all the fancy stuff. Yeah. So let's start with an opening prayer. And um, I'll read a little scripture this morning and we'll begin. Okay. So let's uh, take a breath and get into our hearts. Open up to receive the sermon and the sacrament and um, lift up whatever's in your heart to release it and be open to receive whatever God has in mind for you today. Okay. Good morning, Heavenly Father, Mother God. Good morning, Master Jesus and Blessed Mother Mary. Saints and angels and helpers of our souls, we greet you this morning. We thank you that we can set this time aside and we can commune with you in spirit, in mind and heart to come into ever deeper understanding of your presence, of your peace, of your love and of the unity of all humankind in Christ. Thank you for the stillness of morning for the freshness of the new day, that we might see clearly into ourselves and offer up our burdens and cares to you in exchange for the blessing of the Holy Sacrament of Communion. We are so grateful to have this means by which to realign ourselves with you. We begin each day walking your way. We open ourselves now in gratitude and in praise in your names, name of the Creator, the Mediators, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So the scripture I want to read today is about the baptism of Jesus, since we're going to be talking about sacraments, and it would be a good place to start. From Matthew chapter 3, verse 13 and on, the baptism of Jesus. Then came from... Galilee to then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, he went up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And behold, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. In the spirit of the baptism, we receive this gospel in Jesus' name, in the name of the Creator, the Mediators, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So good morning again. As I was contemplating um, what to share with you this morning, I have been talking to people about the sacraments, about praying the rosary. And since we did the sacrament of communion last week, I thought, well, it might be a good idea just to talk about what sacraments are, what they do, just as a reminder and a refresher. And also because there is some question, depending on what denomination one belongs to, uh, exactly what happens in the sacraments. So I'm going to tell you about the sacraments and then from my experience as a, a Christian uh, mystical priest, um, what it means energetically and spiritually as well as, um, you know, what the sacraments stand for. But I did wear my vestments today to talk to you about that as well. So this uh, cape-like thing that has a hood on it, it's called a chasuble. And it's worn over a robe that is a deacon's robe, which is called an alb. And I'm standing up so you can see my cincture, which is a rope belt that holds, uh, that's not really to hold things together. It's not that kind of belt. It's a sign of the, some of the um, 
the vows of chastity and purity and simplicity and humility and that kind of thing. Um, and then uh, there is uh, the stole, which is this thing that you wear over. The stole. Um, so there are vestments in, in every tradition that have to do with the history of the tradition. And some of the Christian vestments come from the um, Judaic tradition, since that's the tradition that Jesus was uh, brought up in. Um, and then you have the clerical collar, which you all see on priests sometimes. This white piece, this white bit here is meant to be um, the vow to speak truth, speak God's truth. So in general terms, the black collar and black clothes are worn um, by priests. And then um, during the sacraments, white um, robes are worn. Um, so symbolically speaking, black is a color that absorbs. So as a priest, wearing black is absorbing the um, the story, witnessing the story, the confession, receiving the burdens and um, errors and sins in confession. And um, so it's a it's a an act of service to wear black to say I'm here to to take burdens off of people. Um, and then the white is uh, to radiate, to radiate light, to radiate love, as in the song that I played earlier, um, uh, um, asking God to um, animate our being and sitting in God's light and um, radiating light. So white is a reflective color, reflecting back light to parishioners, pouring out light, radiating light in the sacraments. Um, so the things I'll talk about today are certainly not exhaustive or uh, complete for any particular tradition. They're just my own um, understanding, experience, and study that I've done over the past, you know, 15 plus years um, as a minister. And um, I like to know why things happen the way they do. I like to know why we do what we do. And I think it's important for people to know so that there's not so much mystery about it. And then when you see a, a priest in robes, you're like, oh, they are going to be doing a sacrament. And this is representative of who they are standing in for God, shining God's light in the sacrament, blessing blessing the person receiving the sacrament. Um, so let's talk about the sacraments, the seven sacraments. A sacrament is a sign of grace. Um, and there are signs of grace throughout life that, that um, in the Christian tradition are offered um, to people who um, want to follow the faith of Christianity. The first one is the baptism. And that's why I read about Jesus's baptism in the Jordan. And interestingly, he goes to John the Baptist who recognizes that he's the Messiah and John's like, why am I baptizing you? <laughs> why is that happening? And Jesus said, we have to fulfill all righteousness. So, you know, there's a lot of history about, you know, if you're not baptized, you go to hell. If you're not, you know, there's a lot of negative history on baptism. But what I want to talk about is that the, the sets of sacraments, so the first sacraments are called the sacraments of initiation, and they're initiation into the body of Christ. So when the dove came down, the skies open, and the voice of God said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. That is acknowledgement of the connection of an initiation into the body of Christ. So that's what the baptism is, initiating us into the body of Christ. Initiation means a start or a beginning. So it is a blessing, a grace that initiates um, a human being into the body of Christ. Now, uh, the, the baptism is generally done with water, and it's meant to wash away um, past error and misgiving. Um, a lot of question about why does why do babies get baptized? Why do they need to have you know the original sin washed away? You know, if you think about this um, as a, you would with a, a small child, you bathe them, you bathe them because you love them. So the bathing for, of an infant is bathing them because you love them. And, and in my tradition, the the baptism that happens for a baby or a child is not the full baptism because um, we want the, the person who's receiving that baptism to be fully conscious and consenting and saying, yes, I want to be initiated into the body of Christ. So the baptism is um, a choice to align yourself with the Christ. Um, in the mystical tradition also, another, another sacrament is called confirmation, uh, sometimes called um, well, I guess it's the chrism, I guess is what the other, um, the other name for it. Um, so that is a baptism by fire or oil. And that is when you're old enough to consent and know what you're doing. So it's a little bit more mature, um, uh, 
recognition that strengthens the baptismal grace that, that uh, you get at baptism seals it in. So in the Christian mystical tradition, there's baptism with water and oil. And then there's an initiation called illumination, which is um, a little bit more like what this is saying for a confirmation is sealing in that commitment. Now that sounds, you know, it sounds, well, it is mystical in a sense. Um, it sounds that way because what's happening is that the blessings are starting up uh, energetic systems in our bodies, in our beings, to remember who we are. So in the baptism, we're starting up a connection between the, you know, uh, if we looked at them physically, the pineal and pituitary glands that help us uh, commune with God, um, let, let light into our being. Um, so we're, we're given birth in a physical form, and then at the baptism, we're, we're kind of given birth in the, <clears throat> in the spiritual form. And that's why sometimes it's called born again. People say they're born again. So that is what the priest does. The priest is ordained and um, vowed to service and given the authority to pour that blessing into the being. So most of that's done through the top of the head um, into the being of the recipient of that baptism and confirmation to move energy, move the energy of God into their being. Not because the energy of God's not there, but to consciously connect with the energy of God. So when we do rituals, they're not empty rituals. People think that they might be wrote in empty rituals. And a lot of times people uh, rebel against that, understandably. Why would you do something if you didn't know why you were doing it? Um, but also our world is very materialistic. So when you say the blessing is we're moving grace from the heavens into the body of the recipient or into the, the blessing of, say, someone who's dying or a wedding um, and or, uh, or ordaining someone, that that is actually a real movement of spirit, like we talked about last week with the communion. We're asking the heavens, we're opening the heavens and pulling down the energy of the spirit into the person that's receiving it. So the baptism is initiating that, the confirmation is confirming or expanding on that. And then the Eucharist is the way that we stay present with it. We have the Eucharist that we talked about last week, the communion blessing that we can receive every day as a reminder. I belong to Christ. I, I want to live like the Christ lived. Um, I, I am a follower of the ways of Christ. So those are the called the, initi the sacraments of initiation, the beginning of that relationship and continuing that relationship with, um, with God through Jesus. Um, in my tradition, a child, as a child, you can be baptized under your parents or guardians, um, you know, consent. But then when you become a young adult, then you choose again for yourself and would be baptized as an adult. And all the things that go along with that, with your own conscious desire to continue that relationship and deepen that relationship with the Christ. Um, and the, the Lords of Earth, you see behind me, Jesus and Mary, came to show us how to live that life. They did not create the baptism, because as you see here, Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. Um, and so he wasn't, um, uh, he wasn't uh, like the Eucharist, he gave the Eucharist as a sacrament, but he was baptized himself in all righteousness. So, so we take that to say, it's a good idea to have a baptism because it sets our intention, our conscious intention and desire to grow in relationship with the Christ. And of course, it's a blessing, which we, which, you know, we like to be connect, feel connected to God and be in the graces of God. And so we use the sacraments to, um, to initiate, strengthen, and maintain that, that blessed connection. So the next set of sacraments are the sacraments of healing, and that's reconciliation and the sacrament of the sick, or what used to be called last rites. So reconciliation is uh, you've been baptized, you're you've been confirmed, you've decided to follow the Christ, you do take communion to remind yourself, and then you, you have a slip up. You do something that you say, oh, that's not really something that I would want to do. Um, that's not something that Christ would have me do or love would have me do. And so I need to reconcile myself to the spirit of Christ. So interestingly, the word reconciled means to, to, be, to become friendly again. So when we do something um, hurtful, say before you're baptized, you do something hurtful, it's a good idea to, um, to uh, 
reconcile uh, with God about that by, by having contrition or remorse about it, by confessing it so that someone can witness that. Generally, that happens with a minister. Um, and then to um, get absolution, which is forgiveness through the, through the power of the minister, and maybe some um, penance or sacrifice, which means you do something to kind of make up for the thing that you did. So um, I don't know about you, but before I was baptized, I had done some things I wasn't so proud of. And so I confessed those to a priest and I asked for absolution and I did the penances that I was given, which basically were and generally have to do with making amends or saying prayers, either for the person that you've harmed or uh, just for forgiveness. Uh, confession and absolution and penance get a really bad rap in the modern world because they're looking, people look at it like it's punishment. Um, in fact, what we're doing is unburdening ourselves. We know the word is active and powerful. As we say the things that we've done that we're not proud of, it, it is relieving us of that. And as the priest in black receives that confession, they receive the confession, they take the burden of it off of you. And then in God's name, receive it and absolve it. That means it's as if it never happened. Um, knowing that your intention is to stay in the body of Christ in, and being loving and peaceful. So it's kind of like a, you know, a commitment. Like with anyone you love, if you love them, you have the best intentions to be kind and loving and supportive. And then you might make a mistake and you might do something mean or you might say something uh, out of frustration. And, and then you go back and apologize for it, right? And you set it straight and you become friends again with that person or you align yourself again with love. It's the same thing with God. We want to reconcile ourselves either before baptism, which is a good kind of clearing out. Um, and I think many, if not all of you here have, have been baptized um, in the tradition that I'm in. But if you haven't, generally what happens is you meet with a priest beforehand and tell them your life story and tell them what happened to you and what you did that you're not proud of and forgive people and receive forgiveness so that you're kind of starting fresh. And then the baptism happens and the confirmation happens and the communion happens. And then when you do something, you, um, something that you wish you hadn't done, um, you go back again and reconcile, confess it, absolve it, go on, um, re, um, reunited with the Christ in you. And it's not that God leaves us in those moments. The reuniting is that we, we feel ashamed or contrite for doing something. And so we separate ourselves in shame. And so this is a cleansing, another cleansing that says, you know, come back in. You did that thing. I forgive you. Let's begin again. Just like you would with anyone you love. If they did something, you, um, you, uh, you forgive them, right? Now, there are some things that we do. Uh, I think in the Catholic tradition, they have the mortal sins and venial sins, right? There are some, sin, there are some things we do. There are some mistakes we make that are somewhat easy to forgive. You know, we say something mean. I'm sorry, I was mean. But there are other mistakes that are bigger and they have more impact. Like if you steal something from someone or you, you cheat in a relationship or you harm someone physically. Or, and those are more complicated, right? You, can't, you don't just say, oh, I'm so sorry, I, I hit you. You know, you'd have to do something actively to um, make amends and have some penance. Now, in, in our world at large, that's called the law, right? You're, you're facing some legal uh, or maybe, maybe prison or community service or something to make amends for what you did so that you can free yourself of that burden. You make up for it as best you can. Um, and, then, um, and then you're a friend again to the relationship to society, to your relationship with God. Um, and ideally that would happen so that you can be free again because everyone's going to make mistakes. You know, everybody, um, the apostles all made mistakes, you know, Paul, I mean, now Peter denied Jesus three times on the day he was killed. So kind of a big mistake, you know, say, I don't know him. Um, and, uh, the, the thing I want you to remember about reconciliation or what's often called confession. So in the Catholic church, they say you, you want to have, you need to have confession before you receive the sacrament of communion. Again, those rules become dogmatic and people don't understand. And then they just feel guilty instead of saying, yeah, I want to lift, I want to take this off my heart so that my heart can be fully open to receive the blessing of the sacrament. Now in our culture, we have lots of rules and, you know, 
morals put upon us. But in our hearts, we know what is, what is uh, not right, you know, when you do something that's not right. And it's not about feeling shame for it. It's about having the natural contrition or remorse to say, I wish I hadn't done that. You know, if I was in a better place or space, I, I probably wouldn't have done that. Or even if you did it purposefully, I wish, I hope that in future I don't do that kind of hurt people. Um, so that's reconciliation. So you see, God gives us these sacraments, or we have these sacraments so that we can stay tuned in, stay tuned in. We start off with the baptism, confirmation, the communion, we reconcile when we get off track. When we're dying, there's another sacrament that is called, uh, I think it's called Sacrament of the Sick now. It was been, been called Extreme Unction and Last Rites, and that is a blessing for someone who is dying, who is somewhat imminently dying. If they're alert and awake, they do a confession, they receive communion, and then they get the blessing to carry them over into the next life. If they're not alert and awake, they just get the blessing. And um, sometimes they, you know, uh, when, I do, when I do a sacrament of the sick, I anoint the person with oil and say a blessing for their spirit to um, be free of whatever it is that it would keep them from going to God. Again, not because God's punishing, but because it's hard for our being and our spirit to reunite with love when we feel like we've been less than loving. So I'm hoping that in talking about these, we can take the sting and the guilt out of the sacraments and restore them to um, rituals or ceremonies or blessings of love and connection so that when we do them, we can come with joyful, with a joyful anticipation of this sacrament of communion is going to reunite and reignite my being with the knowing that I am one with God, just like Jesus is. That is what the sacraments are meant to do. Unfortunately, people and institutions get a hold of them and then they become twisted and do other things, you know, a lot of guilt around them, a lot of, um, I don't know, I'll just say nonsense that, that um, it gets very complicated. But in the spirit of it, it's not complicated at all. It's a, a, a proclamation. I love God. I want to be united with Christ. How do I stay that way throughout my day as a human being who's in the world with all kinds of things that arise in, the, in, the, in a given day? Um, how do I clean up my history and um, pray for my future to be more aligned with love? Um, and so a lot of words get um, charged or have, have been charged, um, like the word confession. Um, like the word absolution. Um, and the, it's, un, it's unfortunate that they become charged in a negative way that make people feel bad because really what we're doing is saying, um, how do we remain in love? How do we remain in love with God? How do we restore ourselves to a friendly, friendliness with God when we step away? So I hope that lifts your spirits a little bit, thinking about them that way. I think it's a beautiful thing that we have all these opportunities to do these conscious rituals that reconnect us with God and keep us in tune with our highest self and with the love that created us and the love that, that carries us through life, the love that's available to us to provide grace for us. And that is a blessed life, you know, to live in grace is a blessed life. And it, it, it makes all of life easier and more beautiful, even when life can be challenging and, and um, difficult. The last two sacraments, matrimony is one, the blessing of marriage and the holy orders, which is uh, ordination. Um, so these are called the sacraments of service. So interestingly, there's two sacraments of service. You get married, have a family, and that's your service to the world. Whether you, know, whether you have children or not, but the marriage, the love in that relationship is blessed in the, the, um, the sacrament of uh, matrimony so that you can have God's love and sight on your relationship which is really a beautiful thing. You can think about it. If you're marrying someone and you want to have the best possible outcome to keep the two of you together, united together and in tune with God at the same time, that's a really great blessing to have because we all know that relationships are challenging and we can make lots of mistakes and hurt people we love. And, and um, it's hard to reconcile if we don't remember that we've been blessed by God to do this well. And so every time that we step away, we have this pattern already set up that we can reconcile with one another, we can come with contrition, we can ask for forgiveness, we can begin again. So the, the blessing of uh, uh, the sacrament of matrimony is to bless the marriage um, 
uh, in service to love. You know, and marriage is one of the hardest things to um, navigate in love because all of our stuff comes up. It's a, just, a, just a petri dish and a pressure cooker all at once. Um, all of our stuff comes up and we are challenged and changed and, um, and uh, grown and strengthened um, in, that, in the process of that relationship. So yeah, do we want to, do we want God part of that? Yeah, probably would help. So that's the, that's the sacrament of uh, matrimony. And then holy orders. So in, in the Christian tradition, they're generally deacons, priests, and bishops. Those are the three ordinations. Um, um, the, generally speaking, uh, a bishop is, uh, uh, or right reverend, as they're called, is the level of, um, of service, uh, level of clergy that does ordinations, that ordains deacons and priests. So I'm a priest. Uh, I've been a priest for 15 years. I'm starting to be called to do other things that are related to more like what a bishop would do. So I'm investigating, you know, what would it, what would that be like to take on that ordination so that then I could pass along those, um, those um, blessings of holy orders to people who wanted to serve in a more clerical uh, way. So I'm looking at that because I haven't, I haven't looked at it so far because it hasn't really been up for me, but recently it's starting to turn around in me again. So I'm looking into that. Um, so these are the seven sacraments, the seven graces that support our lives living in Christ. And each one of them represents a minister moving energy from the heaven worlds, moving God's love into a person or a situation in order to bless it so that that person in that situation can feel and, and be, be aware of the, the presence of God in them and around them while they're going through whatever it is that they're going through. Um, so if we think about that, that there are signs of grace, the sacraments, it means that there are intervals in life where we check in to make sure that we're fully open to the graces that are available to us. Um, and why do we need ministers to do that? You know, can't we bless one another and baptize one another? And, you know, it is true that we can love one another. And in some Christian traditions, they say anybody can serve the Eucharist, anybody can baptize. But the thing that I think is important to understand in a way that our world is, um, has some trouble with is that it's not so much about hierarchy as it is about the job and the training. So um, if you um, wanted something to be done that you've never done before, you would go and find someone who has the training and the commitment to that, that uh, service. And you would want to know what their credentials are, I guess, you know, like if you want me to be your therapist, you're going to look at my resume. Like, do you have what it takes to be a therapist? You know, uh, do you have what it takes to be a minister? And the church, um, and especially I think in Catholicism, but not only in Catholicism, oftentimes elevates the servants above those who are being served, which doesn't make any sense and doesn't actually follow what Jesus said. Even at the last supper, Jesus washed the feet of his disciples. He washed their feet. He was their servant. He said, if you, want to, um, if you want to be like me, you have to serve. You have to serve other people. And so the, the ministers are actually servants. And that means that we take it upon ourselves or are called in the spirit to be an instrument for the sacraments, for the movement of grace into the planet to bless people's lives. That doesn't mean that I'm more important than someone else. It just means that that's the job that I took on. God called me to that job and I said yes. And then God blessed me through the holy orders, through my own baptism, my own confirmation, my own confessions and reconciliations and all of that um, to offer this particular service. So, so the holy orders are a sacrament of service. And the service is, I will go and be an instrument for these sacraments for other people. I will be a person who receives their burdens. 
and helps to unload their burdens and uplift them. I will be someone who, who consciously and repetitively calls down the graces of God through the sacrament of communion and, and baptism and confirmation and all the others. So it's not meant to be hierarchical and it's unfortunate that it's become that way because Jesus served. He, he had power, you know, and the, the holy orders that are bestowed upon ministers do give us a particular kind of power to do the service that we've agreed to do for God. Um, but why, why do we do that? Why do we do that? So we can be better than other people or have power over other people? No, so that we can help people to reunite with their God and be in grace, the grace that we know from our own experience and the grace that Jesus promised us through his life. So I am the servant of everyone who comes before me. And, and that is a, an interesting um, juxtaposition to, I have the power to call heaven into earth right? So that's why it's very important as one of the vows that a priest takes humility is to say, the only reason that I can call heaven to earth is because God has asked me to and allowed me to and blessed me in this way that allows me to do this. But the whole point of it is for God and I to help people become unburdened, reconnected to God, realigned with the spirit in themselves. Then, then the priesthood is just there as a support to your life. It's not there to, um, to uh, you know, lord it over people. And that's one of the reasons, and rightly so, one of the reasons that the world has rebelled against a lot of formal religion because it's been, that authority has been misused and, um, and people have been mistreated. And that's a real crying shame to think that someone in service to God and to Christ would use that authority and that, um, that position uh, to do harm. Um, or to inflict pain on other people. So that is, a, is heartbreaking. You know, that makes the angels weep to say, oh, I, you came to, uh, to serve and instead you, uh, you did harm. Um, so the, the ministry is when you have had the reality of the relationship with your being and the Christ, and you've experienced that for yourself. In some people, it is, um, it ignites in you the desire to share that with other people. Because when you're in love with love, life is joyful, there's comfort and strength, and, and all, the, all the things we talked about, the gifts of the Spirit, and, um, and, uh, the fruits of the spirit that arise in us and, and life becomes really heavenly, you know, and then you start to do what Jesus said, which is to be in the earth, but not of the earth because you're living in the flow of grace. And that is a different experience than people living in the world. Um, not to say um, that makes me better than people living in the world. I think it makes me maybe more fortunate to have found my way to that life and then to be able to share that life with other people. Because what I see in the people that I share it with is they become lighter, not just metaphysically speaking, but lighter in spirit, in mind, in heart. Their life is more full of joy and comfort and grace. They, they um, naturally become loving and want to give and become kind and compassionate and become servants, even if they don't become um, ministers. They become servants of love. And that is what the Brother and Sisterhood of Christ is about. That's what being initiated into the body of Christ is about. About being in love with love and then becoming an instrument of love, as um, St. As Francis would say. Make me an instrument of your peace. Where there's darkness, let me bring light. Where there's sadness, let me bring joy. Where there's hatred, let me bring love. And then you do the very challenging work of clearing out all that stuff, and all the human stuff in you, so that you can be an instrument of those things for others. The sacraments are blessings that help us get aligned and stay aligned with that truth. So I hope that that um, clarifies some things for you. And when I think about myself as a minister, I think about when I was in training and I was kind of, I was very squirrely and rebellious. And uh, I had to question everything. And, and I did, I questioned everything. And it was important to do that so that I could understand what it was exactly that I was doing that was different from what I could see happening in the world. 
there was a time in my life where I couldn't even say the word God. I called it, I said the G word, you know, because I felt so disillusioned with how the world had used religious and spiritual traditions to lord it over people and to inflict um, more suffering instead of alleviate suffering, which is what I thought the God of love would do. So it was a great blessing for me and a great relief to find a path that led me to the, the God of my own being that now um, has offered me the, the training and the clearing to be available to other people to bring that, that blessing and uh, that knowing into their consciousness. It's not me giving it to them. It's me helping to unburden so that it can be revealed within them th that very truth that, that you and God are one just like me and God are one, just like Jesus and God are one, all of us, all of us. So the hierarchy is kind of nonsense. It doesn't make any sense. We're all souls made by the same God. There is no hierarchy. Whether you live in grace or not, that is, there, there are certainly people who live outside of grace because of their confusion or their um, lack of opportunity to know that there's another way. And that's why a lot, of, <clears throat> a lot of people evangelize, because they want to say, hey, there's another way to live. But again, we've, um, we've kind of taken a lot of the beauty out of uh, religious traditions because they've been used to um, do harm, which understandably makes people skittish, you know. So I keep doing it anyway because, uh, you know, the love and the grace that I live in thanks to God, um, is a way of living that um, I always knew was possible, but never knew how to get to. Always had this kind of hole in my heart saying, there's got to be some other thing about life. Like, what is this? And uh, when I found that, and when I, when I um, you know, went through my training and had the initiations I had and <clears throat> became a friend to God, you know, um, I remember in, when I had the initiation of self-realization, which doesn't show up here, interestingly. I have to look at that more. <clears throat> We're coming face to face with God. And I just felt, I have a friend. I have a friend that is true and is never going to leave me. That was the feeling I had. I have a friend. And so that feeling, that joyful feeling of having a friend that will never leave you, never betray you, never do harm to you, always be available to you that is uh, a place of deep deep rest and and great joy to, in knowing that you don't have to search anymore for love that it's available to you all the time um, and that takes care of 90 percent of the heaviness of life and the other 10 percent, you do it with god so then it's not quite so heavy so i i pray um genuinely from my heart that you can Look inside your own heart, see what relationship you want to have with God and with love. And if, of course, if there's any way that I can help you get there, I'm happy to do that. But even your prayers um, will start that rolling. Your desire will start that rolling, allowing for more and more opportunity and space in you to um, receive the blessings of grace. Um, yeah, so that's what I wanted to talk about today. Let me see if there's anything else before I go on to our communion sacrament. I wrote notes, I hardly ever do that. I was talking to a pastor this week and, and about Sunday service and he's like, oh, I spent so much time, hours and hours, I'm up to 60 hours to create my Sunday service. I was like, wow, 60 hours. Um, and I joked with him and said, well, why don't you just let the spirit move, you know? Jesus said, don't worry about what to say and what to do, just let the spirit move. And so I actually wrote notes, which is unusual for me. But I wrote the notes because I wanted to make sure I didn't forget anything and that I um, spoke about the form and then the content of each of the sacraments so you can have a better view of them. But the, uh, the chant I played this morning before I started recording um, is called God of My Being. And I want to just read, I want to, say this to you again. I might sing it to you because I, I want you to feel the movement of this, the prayer that says, um, what is my soul doing in relationship to God? So 
I'm going to give it a go. I'm going to give it a go sing it to you. I'm going to sing through three times. So you can close your eyes and receive it, or you can sing along if you know it. Some of you might know it. Um, this is a prayer from our hearts to the God of our being, to God inside of us. This is how it goes. God of my being, I call you forth to animate my claim. I give my heart and mind to you. Take me in your light, in your embrace, and let me stay in you. And let me stay in you. God of my being, I call you forth to animate my claim. I give my heart and mind to you. Take me in your light, in your embrace, and let me stay in you. And let me stay in you. God of my being, I call you forth to animate my claim. I give my heart and mind to you. Take me in your light, in your embrace, and let me stay in you. And let me stay in you. O Mother, Father, most glorious, and Christos, most high, through the great masters of earth, Jesus and Mary, we beseech thee to absolve us of all error and misgiving. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. O Lord of earth, Thou grantor of all prayers, it is my word that this bread shall be transmuted into the flesh of thy body and thy mind. Being transformed, I commend it in your memory for the forgiveness of sins. Glory unto the Creator for its power. Glory unto the mediators for their life. Glory unto the Holy Spirit for its nature. 
for thus is transformed the essence of earth and heaven. Amen. Into the blood of our most glorious Lord of earth, Jesus Christ. O God of creation, through thy holy word and through the power granted unto me over the life and the death of creation, do I commend myself unto the transformed wine and blood of our Lord Jesus for the raising of the, sac for the, raising of the consciousness. And may now the Holy Spirit descend through it and infuse it with life eternal. Amen. All souls gathered here partake of the body of Jesus and know that by the fruits of your labors, you are absolved of all past error and misgiving. Thus you are a partaker of the life through Christ Jesus. In Jesus and Mary's names, this is done. Name of the creator, the mediators and the Holy Spirit, amen. Drink of the blood of Jesus, which is infused with the essence of the great Christos above. Now go forth and let your light shine before all. In Jesus and Mary's names, this is done. Name of the Creator, the Mediators, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Holy Ones, we thank you for the blessing of this sacrament and for all of the sacraments that keep us aligned to your grace as we move through our days and through our lives. We thank you for attending to our humanity and restoring us to our divinity, that we might live a life of grace and be instruments of your peace in the earth. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all that you do for us for all the ways you call us home to love, the beauty of nature, the beauty of relationships, for all of the helpers for our souls that surround us. Thank you. We offer our hearts up to love now in your holy names, Jesus and Mary, name of the creator, the mediators, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Go forth now, restored to the grace that belongs to your spirit. May you remember Jesus and Mary's love and God's presence in and around you in each moment of this day. Be blessed in their names, in the name of the Creator, 
the mediators, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much for joining me today. Blessings and peace to you on your day. Uh, we do have this week coming up as the summer solstice, very powerful week in lots of ways. So we'll talk about that next weekend. Peace to you. Bye-bye.